Good evening. I'm David Cataforis, Professor and Chair of Art History at the University of Kansas. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Kaw people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. I'm pleased to welcome you to another lecture in our ongoing series, Intersections of Identity, Expression, Exchange, and Hybridity. The series asks, what constitutes identity? How do people navigate and form and reform their sense of self? And how can the study of art and its history help us to consider the diverse identities expressed by visual culture and its creators? We seek to amplify the voices of scholars and artists whose work explores individual and collective identities as those intersect with notions of the body, disability, gender, heritage, and race. The series is organized by KU's Crest Foundation Department of Art History and the graduate students of the History of Art, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Committee. It is sponsored by the Franklin Murphy Lecture Fund. We present it in partnership with the Spencer Museum of Art and KU Department of Visual Art. The graduate students and I want to thank Art History Department Office Manager Lisa Clore for all of her organizational help and acknowledge the creator of the poster for today's lecture, KU student Cormac Palmer. Unfortunately, we are not able to offer ASL interpretation services with this talk. For those who require it, we, we offer auto-generated closed captioning services located at the bottom of the video. We apologize in advance for any discrepancies and errors. Additionally, all artworks and images presented in this talk will be accompanied by a textual description in the live chat, available as the images appear on screen. Now I'm honored to introduce this evening's speaker, Riva Lehrer, an artist, writer, and curator who focuses on the socially challenged body. She is best known for representations of people whose physical embodiment, sexuality, or gender identity have long been stigmatized. Ms. Lehrer's work has been seen in venues including the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution, Yale University Art Gallery, the United Nations, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the Arnett Art Museum, the Cordova Museum, Fry Museum, the Chicago Cultural Center, and the Illinois State Museum. Her awards include the 2020 Disability Futures Fellowship of the Ford Foundation, the Nick and Kevin Wilder Award for Excellence in Teaching from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the 2017 Three Arts McDowell Fellowship for Writing, a 2015 Three Arts Residency Fellowship at the University of Illinois, the 2014 Carnegie Mellon, excuse me, Carnegie Mellon Fellowship at Haverford and Bryn Mawr Colleges, and the 2009 Prairie Fellowship at the Ragdale Foundation. Grants include the 2009 Critical Fierceness Grant, the 2008 Three Arts Foundation Grant, and the 2006 Wynn Newhouse Award for Excellence, as well as grants from the Illinois Arts Council, the University of Illinois, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Riva Lehrer's memoir, Golem Girl, was published by the One World imprint of Penguin Random House in October 2020. It won the 2020 Barbellion Prize for Literature, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and shortlisted for the Chicago Review of Books 2020 Cherby Awards. I've read it and you should too. It's amazing. Riva Lehrer is represented by Regal Hoffman and Associates Literary Agency in New York City and by Zola Lieberman Gallery in Chicago. She's on the faculty of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an instructor in the medical humanities departments of Northwestern University. Uh, this evening, Riva Lehrer will tell us a bit about her book and present a short reading from Golem Girl. Then she'll engage in a conversation with me about aspects of her artwork. And then we'll open the program up to questions from the audience uh, that will be moderated by Logan Ward from our uh, graduate students DEAI committee. So please type your questions into the uh, chat in YouTube uh, as the program continues. I'm now going to share my screen with the cover of the book and ask Reba to come in and start the reading and uh, I think tell us a little bit about the um, the 
the book as well. Uh, can I be seen yet? I can't be seen yet. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Not sure why I'm not being seen. I think uh, we see you. Okay, well, I don't see myself, so that's fine. Not a problem. Um, I really got to cut down that bio. It's taking up way too much land uh, landscape. <clears throat> anyway, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I've been doing book events for a while now, and knowing that I am connecting with people that are just everywhere is an amazing experience. So a little bit about the book before I do a reading. Um, I, it took me about eight years to write. Uh, it's a memoir in two parts. The first part is about what it meant to grow up at a time way before the ADA or really any um, rights whatsoever on the behalf of disabled people at all, without curb cuts, without automatic doors, without you name it, um, we were pretty much stuck in our houses. Uh, if we had mobility impairments or a range of other impairments, we were not welcome in general society. There's a lot about uh, medical history in there and a whole lot about my very weird family. Um, yes, you're not the only one with a really weird family. I see you out there. Uh, so, one of the things about the book itself as an object, and I also happen to have a copy here, um, is that it's a catalog resume of most of my work. So my publisher, so let me find some pictures here. My publisher was amazing. Um, those of you who read uh, books with images will often see what's called a signature, which is when they, um, uh, produce a book with a lot of photographs and they put them all in kind of a thick insert in the middle of the book or at the end of the book. And that is the most economic way by far to produce a book with images. What I wanted was, one of the words for it is color on page, meaning that I wanted the images to be in the story because the story was so much about the images. And when One World took me on and uh, committed to doing that, it was tremendous. So for instance, this is how the book looks. Inside, you will see a portrait. Um, sometimes you'll see a, 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 one of my personal photos, a family photo. Um, I know there's some in here, oh, tiny. Um, some of them are historically very rare and very important, for instance. This is my first grade, first or second grade class at a special school I went to. I don't know if you guys can see this, but um, the school no longer exists. Almost no documentation about it exists anymore. So what photographs I had, I put in the book. So the first part of the book is about that. And so it's in two sections. First section is called Golem, and the second is called Girl. And so the first part is about being formed as a monster. And the second part is about trying to become a human. And in that, it really tells the story of my uh, starting in art school, um, but where my art went from periods when it was really foundering <clears throat> to when everything changed. And I began the career that I have now. So I'm going to read um, a section. I'm going to read a short chapter that actually is the moment that everything changed. There was another major change directly after this, but this is really the pivot point um, of my entire professional career. So uh, in the book, um, each chapter is named after a uh, a horror film or a horror novel. Um, and so this one is called, getting the reading glasses. This chapter is called Picture of Dorian Gray. 
Chicago, spring 1994. Um, oh, a little background. Uh, I had been married to a woman and, um, I'm, had, pardon me, <coughs> had just under, sorry. Uh, my voice has been pretty rough today. Please forgive me. Hot liquids. I have this little nifty little Mr. Coffee, coffee warmer <laughs> right next to me. So that, um, which I just unplugged. Oh well, tries to keep the mug hot. So this is right after the end of my marriage. A year went by. I began to date again. My new girlfriend was on the mailing list for the Anderson Ranch Art Center. I was slipping through her catalog and a picture caught my eye. It was a painting called Mea Corpa by Bailey Dugan. I'd seen her work during historian Joanna Frew's lecture at the Chicago, I'm sorry, at the College Art Association conference not a month earlier. <clears throat> and had been taken by Dugan's toughness and honesty. The catalog, the Anderson Ranch catalog, listed a two-week workshop that summer, quote, painting the psychological self-portrait with Bailey Dugan. My own work had been stalled out for months. This felt like a sign. Uh, parenthetically, art students out there, please go look Bailey up Bailey Dugan, it's B-A-I-L-E-Y-D-O-O-G-A-N, one of the most brilliant and under-recognized feminist painters of the last few decades. Astonishing work. Snowmass, Colorado, summer 1994. Anderson Ranch is a sprawling collection of studios, administration buildings, and cabins clinging to the side of a mountain just above Aspen, itself a virtual Scandinavia, populated with statuesque six-foot-tall blondes and their seven-foot-tall mates, all brandishing skis like Viking spears, which was weird. It was summer. I stood at a grocery checkout and felt like a hobbit. The ranch's parking lot was paved with plum-sized gravel, the absolute worst possible surface for my orthopedic shoes. I couldn't even get out of the car. A passing carpentry instructor saw that I was stranded, ran to his word shop, and came back with a rough cane that let me gingerly hobble to the cabins. I was in line in the cafeteria when a slight and rangy woman appeared at my elbow. Bailey Dugan was all hollow cheeks, tea brown eyes, and feline jaw. Her graying waist length braid twitched like a puma's tail. She drawled, you're Reva, aren't you? I saw you during your orientation. Call me Peggy. Over dinner, call me Peggy, told tales from her days as an advertising illustrator on the Morton Salt account, where she modernized the When It Rains It Pours logo. Later, she showed me drawings of Joanna Frew as a lewd umbrella girl. Sick. Never mind. <clears throat> 7 a.m. in the mountains. Mist scumbled the hill behind my cabin. I sipped coffee and watched a vixen carry her kits through the beaded grass and grabbed my box of Cheerios and headed for the dining hall. Cheapo cereal was going to have to sustain me for the next two weeks. Uh, again, as an aside, I used up all my money getting to this place everything I'd saved, got a scholarship. It was really hard being there. Anderson Ranch is often traditionally for people with a fair amount of money. I think that's changed, but it was, um, it was a very hard place to afford. I got directions to the converted garage that served as the painting studio. Peggy was taping brown paper over the windows. I thought, that's odd. Don't studios need a lot of light? 10 students had signed up for this semester, eight white women, seven blonde, one brunette, one black male nurse, also from Chicago, and me. Peggy explained the reason for the covered windows. 
we were all going to take off our clothes and paint ourselves in the nude. The blood drained from my head as if I'd been guillotined. How had I missed this? Did everybody know this but me? The eight white women looked delighted. All that Nordic track hadn't been for naught. Chicago guy seemed sto stoic. Nurses, I supposed, were professionally copacetic with nudity. I had spent a hell of a lot of time, effort, and money getting here, but no way was I stripping off. The psychological self-portrait indeed. Hieronymus Bosch himself couldn't have designed a tidier hell. I waffled and panicked and waffled some more, even as I claimed my own easel, tabaret, and standing mirror. Peggy went around the room helping people set up, and when she reached me, I pulled her down and whispered in her ear that for me, naked, was the seven seconds a day between stepping out of the shower and into my panties. Peggy nodded a brisk, mm, right, let's find an answer to this, and helped me devise a cabana out of sheets, towels, rope, and clothesline. Just enough space for me to remove my clothing as long as I remembered not to lean against the terra cloth walls was all too aware that my naked feet with their contracted Pez Cavus arches were exposed beneath the edges of the towels. I had nowhere to run. The mirror was inches from my skin. By day three, I'd simply become a series of abstract problems to be solved as questions of measurement, color, and texture took over. I became an object, an animal a subject in need of observation and nothing more. I let my brushwork trace, track the convolutions of scars and the asymmetry of bones. Peggy circled the studio instructing and correcting. And when she got to me, I muttered, wait a minute, sorry, sorry, threw on my t-shirt and my shorts. She couldn't see my body. So all she could do was guess at whether I what I painted was real. Acrylic paint is removed with dabs of isopropyl alcohol. My impromptu exam room smelled like a hospital. I stand in a bare room. A torn window shade casts a circle of light. My hands claw the walls and a compass rose flares on my belly. The title is Corner, Terra Incognita. Terra Incognita is Latin for unknown lands. During the 15th and 16th uh, golden age of exploration, I think we have different names right now, like the golden age of imperialism, um, Dutch map, map makers illustrated the uncharted areas on maps with monsters. Blank lands abounded with centaurs, with dog-headed cyanomulgi, with headless blemies who wore their faces on their bellies, and with monopods who stomped about on a single elephant, elephantine leg. The seas were full of mermen and mermaids and coiled sea serpents. Monsters were the signs of xenophobia, warnings that people who weren't like us weren't people at all. It takes me months to finish a painting. In September, I brought the panel, still in progress, to my advanced painting class at the School of the Art Institute. I was a student there at the time, I wasn't a teacher. SEIC was several steps up from DAA where I'd gone earlier, but you wouldn't have known it that day. My professor complained, your type brush marks are a form of dishonesty. Let your hand, let me see your hand move, loosen up, use a gestural stroke, then you'll really reveal yourself. Showing myself scarred, and scared wasn't candid enough for him. He was wrong. I had no more secrets. I was able to go forward because I'd done my worst. And that is the painting. There we are. It's a, a very dark slide. Unfortunately, I, I uh, no longer own this and there's a lot that you can't see in it, but that is corner incognita. It's 24 by 18, if I remember right. Okay, let's jump to humans.
Hi, David. Hi, Reva. Thank you for that reading. I thought we were gonna take a, well, maybe not. Okay, you, what, you drive. Um, what would you like to do? Whatever you want is fine. What did you mean by jump to humans? Oh, I thought we were just, the two of us were gonna oh, talk for a while. Us, humans, but, yeah, <laughs> okay, great. Human yeah. beings, human yeah. beings, the actual, the ones that breathe. Yeah. But um, but I'm fine with anything, so I'm well, here to it's great to have you with us. You're in Chicago and we're in Lawrence, Kansas. And, and you know, one of the benefits, if, if it is a benefit of the pandemic, is that we've all learned how to connect remotely like this. Um, you know, it, it, it'll, it allows you also to give a lot more of these talks maybe than, than you've been expecting. So congratulations uh, on the book. I know it's been out for over a year now. And, and um, um, I, as I said in my introduction, I loved it. I couldn't put it down. So you, you, you really have a gift for writing as well as for um, painting and drawing. So um, you, you are really multi-talented and, and we appreciate you being with us to share your, your, your creativity and your ideas. So um, you did prepare a PowerPoint that has a selection of some of your images that we can talk about together. And um, again, invite, uh, the audience to type questions into the chat that we can um, we can uh, uh, engage with later on. And I think that you know we can talk about your your practice as an artist, sort of looking at individual images, and different points will come up at different uh, with different images. Um, so you know we can start with this one, and and this is this is on the cover of your book. And maybe you want to talk about why you chose to put that on the cover of a book and, and sort of, you know, how this speaks to some of your concerns, you know, both personally and, and as an artist. Um, well, mainly I just put this in so that people could see this, the whole image because the book only has a detail. Oh, I mean, right. the cover only has a, a detail. I mean, the, the cover again, I'm sorry, I can't see myself, so I have no idea. We'll both hold it up. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, you can see it's, it's a detail. Um, this was from 99, and I've always been interested. So I've done a lot of art history. I, I left Cincinnati as an art history minor and um, had thought about being a major, but I knew that that would wreck my uh, studio practice. So I decided not to do that, but I have always absolutely loved art history. And if you are interested in figuration, there's no way to not learn about the history of the, particularly the Catholic church of Catholic uh, iconography. And, um, you know, the paintings of the Renaissance really informing, well, all the way through, you know, Byzantine forward. Um, up until what it depends on where you are, but at least, I don't know, early 19th century, um, religious iconography really either dominated figuration or informed figuration uh, to a very high degree. So one of the stories that had caught my attention was the story of St. Veronica. And if I have the story right, uh, Jesus is going up the hill to Calvary, carrying the cross. He's wearing the crown and he's um, bleeding and sweating. And uh, a woman comes out of the crowd and offers to mop his face with her apron. And so she does this. And later when she looks at her apron or unrolls, I guess she rolls it up and, you know, holds on to it. And later when she unrolls it, um, his face is imprinted on the cloth. And this is um, uh, in the tradition of something like the Shroud of Turin, um, Mary appearing on a piece of toast, all, you know, all kinds of things. And they're called, um, one of the words for them is Vera Icon, mm -hmm. true likeness, meaning that the saint or God or Jesus has imposed without an artist in between imposed a direct likeness. 
And so uh, there's a lot of reasons that I'm interested in that story. But um, one thing is that I was thinking about miraculous. <clears throat> what is a miraculous portrait for us now? What, is, what does that look like? So I was thinking about medical technology and how the relationship between something like an X-ray, an MRI, a CT, um, uh, ultrasound, is that um, they're, the body's kind of directly imposing them. I mean, there's this machine, but the first act is not interpretive. The first act is just direct direct uh, relationship between the body and the receiving source. But then after that, the image has to be um, explained the same way that the church would explain these images to the masses, what it meant. And that they're often cryptic and that they often happen uh, at moments of extreme duress. So, this is my version of a of a, of a Veronica. Um, anyway, long explanation, but that's really what that piece is from. And that's an X-ray of, of your own torso. Yeah, or, it's an X-ray of my own torso, veiling your face. Yes. Yeah. Can you explain the? Um, are they feathers? These brightly colored. Yeah, they're parrot feathers, and um, I really I wanted to like set you know signal that this was a strange event. Right. You know, um, later I realized it could be interpreted as a parrot flew into the engine of an airplane. But I wasn't thinking about that. I, I think something we see throughout your work are these imaginative elements uh, that, that add metaphorical meaning. So that's something that we can watch for. Uh, this is um, you, you work in series. Yes. Uh, so this is from the Totems and Familiars series. Is that right? Well, let me bridge the, the chapter that I just read to this. Um, so after my time at Anderson Ranch, so some backstory. When I went to art school originally at U of Cincinnati, um, I was heavily, heavily dissuaded from working on anything about embodiment. It was the 70s. Um, the school was extremely conservative. Didn't even like female students, much less weird female students. Didn't know what to make of me. And um, I wasn't sure why I was even being an artist. I mean, I hadn't entered school wanting to do work about meaning. I'd entered school having been someone who was an illustrator for the Cincinnati Zoo. So I wasn't thinking about, you know, deeply meaningful work, but then I started to really see art history and understand what art actually looked like, what the purposes were, and um, wanted to try and uh, explore at least a little of what it meant to be different, and they just stomped all over me. Mm. So I struggled with that for a long time, didn't do, I did very encoded work, pretty timid. And that's why going to Anderson Ranch, when I said my work had been stalled out, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was doing pet portraits. I was, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I was making some personal stuff, but it was, um, yeah, it, it was very indirect and not particularly satisfying. So when I went to Anderson Ranch and it made me really confront my own body, um, that was the big breakthrough. Mm. Mm. So because up until then, I had tried my absolute best to uh, deny being disabled, to just hide it either verbally and with what I wore and with the choices I made, I wouldn't talk to anybody about what my physical life was like. And so... Um, so that, uh, so Peggy happened in, what year was that again? Um, what year was that? God, I'm blanking. Oh, 94 is 94, that. okay, yeah. right. I knew it was before. Okay. So three years later, um, I, I mean, it's not like I leapt directly into giddy honesty. 
<laughs> it was a little bit, I did some self-portraits. That was really, I kept doing some self-portraits, but uh, still kind of treading water a little bit. Didn't know where to go with that. And then I met um, in Chicago, I got invited to join this group called the Disa uh, Disabled Artists Collective. And those were some of the founders of disability culture in America. Just happened to be Chicago was a, was a hotbed of this. And I, I hadn't known anything about it because I kept the hell away. But I had a friend who dragged me into it. And they taught me that disability had uh, theory mm -hmm. and politics and art and humor and style. All these things that I thought had no relationship. Um, I just thought that being disabled was, was about being pathetic, really full stop. So I met these people and they completely blew my mind, totally changed me. And so for 10 years, 10 years, no, wait, uh, five years, five or six years, I did... Um, portraits of this group of people and some other people I met out of town who were all kind of foundational uh, artists and theorists of the field. And then, but, and they were all disabled. And then after that, I realized because I'm also queer that being queer had been the, my first step in to being different mm -hmm. and that Really, what I was interested in was the experience of being different, mm -hmm. different enough that people could spot it in whatever way, you know. I mean, we who are, who are LGBTQ plus, 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 a lot of the ways that we get spotted or not have nothing to do with morphology, mm -hmm. but it's how we carry ourselves, it's how we act and talk and dress and often choose to be identifiable, partly because we want to meet others like ourselves. And there's still no really useful secret handshake. So if you want to meet other people in your community, you have to find some nonverbal way to be spotted and then go from there. So that makes us identifiable. And so I started to do a variety of series where I would come up with a set of questions and get both disabled people, but also queer people and also non-disabled people together and ask them the same questions. Because I wanted to see if the answers they gave me had any, um, were, were the same or not the same answer per se, but was there, was there a different quality at all? Um, in the answers I would get to a consistent set of questions. So this uh, was one series called Totems and Familiars, where I was asking people about how they use their imaginations when they were undergoing uh, trauma for the most part. Um, if they had like a power object or a spirit animal or a hero or anything that was kind of a talisman, literal or figurative that helped them sort of orient themselves during trauma. So I did a number of drawings um, where people told me, and then I, and then we worked on how that story would work. So this is Nomi Lamb. She is a queer performance artist uh, in the Berkeley area, the Bay Area. I think she's in Oakland. She runs Sins and Ballad. Um, she's the artistic director of Sins and Ballad which is a radical social justice arts group, disability social justice uh, arts group in Oakland and um, tremendous singer, it's <laughs> incredible. So this was, I, I don't wanna to totally over, over explain everything, but, um, but the totems drawings are all about those answers. So I think it's really important that you are making portraits of people that you get to know very well. Yes. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of personal involvement on both sides. Do you want to maybe talk a bit more about 
sort of that aspect of your work? I mean, how, how important relationships are to, to the resulting image? Um, um, so all of my work either begins with a long series of interviews where I, what I'm interested in is how their embodiment affects their work. I'm not that interested in people who aren't in an internal relationship between embodiment and product, uh, production. Um, I don't know that I've ever drawn anybody uh, who didn't have um, a pretty clear relationship between embodiment and production. And so either what happens is I, I do a long interview and then I'm taking notes during it. And then I go off and do a bunch of thumbnails based on the stories that they told me. I come back and show them the range of images that I've come up with. And then they tell me, yes, that works. No, that doesn't work. That feels that feels you know accurate. No, it's not. And then we alter again. And then we do several rounds of this. Um, until we come up with an image that uh, that feels true to them. And also, as I say in the book, um, when you are identifiably different, being looked at is painful mm. and or can be, you know, it can, and not 100%, but it certainly often is. And that... Um, doing a portrait means that I'm going to look at them a lot and very directly and for a long time. And so I was trying to figure out how not to make that painful and re-traumatizing. So the way that I formulated was to give them a lot of control. So ergo the interview and then asking you know, showing them the story and having them alter it and having them alter it. Um, of late, though, I've started to work somewhat differently. Why don't we look at a few images and then okay. can explain a little more? So I think a, a lot of what you were speaking about there probably applies to this one also. Yes, and that Matt is in the same series. He is, some of you guys will know who he is if you've watched um, American Horror Story or his dark materials. He's in a few other things. Um, he's a British actor um, who has a phocomelia, which is a condition um, caused when his mother was given a drug when she was pregnant called um, uh, thalidomide. Mm. It was used for morning sickness, but the British and the German manufacturers knew that it caused shortened limbs and some other uh, impairments and they gave it to him in any way. And they have been sued, you know, <laughs> enthusiastically for decades. There are still suits, particularly I think the German manufacturer has still been trying to draw this out, hoping that these people would die off hmm. and they wouldn't have to pay out. So, um, but yeah, you know, this is Matt Frazier. You could look up all these people. Um, and he he's he, he's the one who suggested the the nude. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. His nickname at the time was Teflon Matt because he couldn't keep his clothes on. <laughs> so, yeah, he was right here in this actual apartment, stalking around naked on oh my, my birthday. It was quite a birthday. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So how much how much of your work involves uh, direct drawing or painting from life versus working from photographs or just from your own sort of knowledge of anatomy and other objects? Um, early on, I worked more from photos. And because, like I said, Matt lived in England. Uh, Nomi lived in California. Um, well, I think we'll see um, Lynn Manning later. He's a lot... Los, yeah, Los Angeles. So I was trying to get the people I was interested in whose work I knew when they would come through Chicago. Although at one point I did go to New York um, for a summer 
and work with people there. And if I could get somebody to commit to sittings in real life, I, I bit by bit began to um, transition more to um, uh, really privileging live sittings. I don't really, I do not like working from photos. Mm. I'm doing mm. it right now again because of Zoom, but right. um, very, very frustrating. I would really much prefer not to do that. What do you want to tell us about Lynn Manning? Um, uh, sorry, I, it's that stupid thing. The text start showing up in the middle of your Zoom. I don't need to get text right now, humans. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Lynn. Um, Lynn died about three or four years ago, unfortunately. Um, he, I mean, each one of these people is a very long story. Right. I'm going to try and touch shortly, briefly on each person, because there's hardly anybody here that I couldn't use the entire hour talking about. And I am, in all honesty, losing my voice. So I'm going to be judicious here. Um, Lynn uh, grew up in L.A. in the Watts uh, neighborhood. Um, hang on a sec. Um, he was originally a sculptor and, or a painter rather, and a martial artist. And, um, there's a lot of backstory there, but he got a job in his twenties as a, um, sorry, <coughs> um, as a counselor at a boy's, um, like a home for, for boys who had been in the, I think like in the penal system. And he had just gotten a raise um, and was out celebrating, or I'm sorry, a promotion and was out celebrating with a bunch of friends. Uh, and Lynn was a very big guy, like well over six feet tall, mm -hmm. extremely muscular, very deep voice absolutely gorgeous man and so some guy at the bar was like pushing at him and pushing at him and trying to pick a fight and Lynn's like you know told me like oh little guys did this to me all the time they just see me and they'd like want to come at me like the hell so this guy wouldn't leave him alone and Lynn said you know look I'm with my friends I'm having a good a nice evening just leave me alone man wouldn't do it so finally, Lynn puts out a hand and just shoves the guy and the, the guy goes flying. So a couple hours later, you know, he and his friends were leaving the bar and the guy is right outside the steps of the gun and he shoots Lynn in the head. And Lynn was um, blinded in the shooting yeah. and he transitioned to being um, primarily an actor and a poet. And he also founded Watts Village Theater in LA and um, was just tremendously uh, respected and recognized. And when he died a few years ago, there was, there, I know it hit the people in LA pretty hard. So, um, but yeah, uh, just one more person I loved. So behind every one of these remarkable portraits are, are so many stories and memories and, and personal connections for you. And you, you give a lot of those stories on your website so we can direct uh, our audience to that resource. And you also provide links to websites of these individuals or information about them. So um, your work is sort of opening, opening up invitations to the audience to learn more about all these creative people who face various challenges, but also, you know, are amazingly accomplished in spite of those challenges. I mean, you can also look on Wikipedia, you can right. look at their work, you know, get their books, their movies, their, I mean, these people produced work. Right. 
please don't just take me as as the only thing you know about them. Right. It's a, it, you're offering us this opening to learn more through through so many other avenues and absolutely to to pursue their work. And I I've enjoyed looking at the looking up many of the artists uh, that you've recommended. So um, your work is 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 doing good work for for your friends and subjects as well. Thank so you. this is this now we're now we're seeing a, a work in color up to now. Well, the the first one we showed was was a color painting, um, and this this is um, does this belong to a series, uh, Riva? No, this was a standalone. Yeah. So Liz, uh, Liz um, I actually met her originally through Matt because mm -hmm. they had a long running podcast in uh, London called Ouch that was disability po politics and comedy. And um, really fantastic. I still miss it listening every week. Um, uh, Liz um, is a comedian and has become a very sought after actress. Um, she's, she ended up on a show in Britain on the BBC called Silent Witness, which is like uh, our CSI, but it way predates it. And she played a forensic scientist um, she recently was, I think, on Broadway or mm. maybe in the West End. I'm not sure if she was here or there. Uh, I think there, actually. I think it was West End. Um, doing a production of The Normal Heart. I just saw her posting the next movie she's going to be in. I knew Liz when, when she was fighting just to get a, a gig at the Edinburgh Fringe Fest. And now, like Matt, she's doing extremely well. But also, like Matt, I should make the point that both of those people are part of the disability um, uh, culture progenitors in England, mm -hmm. that they, they single-handedly changed how the BBC, and I mean it, between the two of them, they changed how the BBC portrays disabled people. They changed how people think about charity organizations. Liz has been doing work for years on assisted suicide. She actually had, has had an on and off running musical called, uh, I think it's called Assisted Suicide the Musical. <laughs> um, she went to Switzerland and, and pretended actually to be someone who was seeking out um, euthanasia. Um, I mean, they're, they're just my heroes. So Liz was here again for a gig and, um, and sat for me. So this was, this so, is a, what a painting looks like. How did you come up with the idea? Was this a, a, a joint process of coming up with the idea of having her wrapped in these, these lights? It just, you know, I could explain it, but it's just, it's just Liz. Mm -hmm. I mean, the lights go down and become barbed wire. I see. And that's Liz. It's just sometimes just the images. You know, I, I realize I gave you the image. It's very glared out. Um, I'll have to find one of these days the the better slide. Um, this one got kind of washed out at the top, but so, um, but yeah. I mean, there's a there's amazing modulation of of light and shade and color in this. Um, I, I'm wondering. You know, are you actually lighting her in the studio and working from observation? I wrapped her in lights. Yeah. Ah, and, okay. Yeah, I kept wrapping her in lights and turning off the light and turning down the lights and yeah. So yeah. so how, how many? many just at me after a while. How many sessions? I want to sit you, down. <laughs> yeah. How many sessions would that have required? I mean, uh, I think she was only here for three days. Yeah. So I had to get the reference. Um, these days now, if I have to work from photos, I'm now having people pose over Zoom. Yeah. I mean, these days I, I'm forced back into photos because it's COVID. Right. And I can't have anybody in my studio. Right. I mean, yeah, I was you... about to restart rebooking when now there's Omicron and I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Liz, Liz Carr is literally luminous in your portrait of her. Thank you. And this is, this is you, right? With, with the tattoo of your mother's face on your, your arm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I don't think you actually write about this in your book. Am I, am I wrong? I don't think I do. I think but I'm of not course, so much of the book it. is about your mother. Yeah. Just, just, you'll figure it out if you read the book. <laughs> okay. There we go. I don't, I don't think I want to talk about this one. Okay. But it's, um, we don't have to talk about the content so much, but just the, um, when you're painting a self portrait, What's your process involved there? Are you working from photographs? Are you looking in the mirror? I mean, how do you Both. sort of know yourself visually? Both. I mean, some of them, when I've done them from the back, sometimes I've set up. I mean, I have source photos. Um, I use a camera with a, uh, with a timer. Um, I um, sometimes, I'll, if I have a partner, I'll have them take some of my photos. I like to shoot, shoot rough. I do not like it when I end up with photos that are so pretty mm -hmm. that there's nowhere to go. And mm -hmm. lately relying on other photographers has been awful because mm -hmm. they send me these beautiful photographs and I'm like, well, there's the beautiful photograph. You know, I don't, there's nothing I can do with this. So when I shoot, I deliberately don't aim for pretty. You know, I am for lighting and for information, and it's a different mindset. So my photos tend to be very kind of bleh, but they tell me what I need to know. Hmm. And then if, if, it's a, if it's a position where I can see myself, then I have mirrors. I'll, you know, I'll set up mirrors all over the studio. This is a really remarkable composition, the way that you've cropped your, your body, you know, cropped the top of your head. You have that horizon line that's sort of going right through your cheek. And then you're, you're sort of leaning against your shoulder and pulling your, your arm with, with the other hand. Um, how, do you, how do you come up with a pose like that? How do you decide to sort of place the, the body in the rectangle in that way? Or, or do you go, do a lot of different studies and try different things out. It's funny, I was trying to remember this when I was looking at the poster. Um, and it's from 1997. Okay. <laughs> Those brain cells no longer exist. Yeah. But, you know, uh, yeah, you know, there are always sketches and stuff, but usually for a self-portrait, I know what it is I want to say. I don't know how to say it yet. And I just kind of let my mind wander. Usually it'll take days or weeks. I don't like to do, I'm, I'm not somebody who sketches on a regular basis. I don't have sketchbooks anymore. I don't, I don't do daily observational sketching, mainly because my life is so clobbered. I barely have time to get my groceries, really. Yeah. Um, but usually things will kind of mush around for a while. And the problem with doing sketches is that they start to take over. And it's really hard to let my mind wander once there's anything down on paper. So I don't do any sketching until it comes together. And then I'll just kind of scribble something, often kind of incoherent. And it's enough, you know, what position, how big is it going to be on the paper? What's the angle? That's about it. I mean, you wouldn't know for, at all if you saw one of my sketches for a, for a painting with that, what the relationship was at all. And that leaves me space to just kind of, um, you know, start shooting. Um or start directing someone else to shoot me. I mean, it's the same with the portraits of other people to some extent. I mean, yeah, I try and let my mind, I mean, when I have to do sketches for someone else, it's different. It's, that's the annoying part of it is that once I start sketching for somebody else, then things get concrete for me way too early and way too fast. So, um, but it's the nature of the beast. I, I've learned that if you just verbally describe something to someone, 
what they're imagining and what you're imagining, mm-hmm. <laughs> no, you know, different planets. I would think it'd be hard to come up with a really precise verbal description of, I mean, artists and art historians were trained to translate the visual into the verbal, but you know, it would take, it would take a lot of time and words to, to sort of translate an image like this into, into words. Um, yep. I'm, I'm conscious of, of our time um, uh, evaporating and, and there are a lot more slides. So, and we also wanna make sure to have time for um, uh, audience to, to ask their questions. So Do you wanna just flip through them and then- Yeah, yeah let me just flip through them. Um, because yeah, like you said, we could talk about any one of these for a really long time. And then, you know, we can come back to any that you'd like to talk about, and we can also open it up to questions and Logan Ward can come in and help to moderate that. I mean, most kids are pretty well-known people. So Alison Bechdel is extremely famous. Um, oh, never mind. We Tim do. Lowley, uh, really well-known artist. Um, Sherry Rush is getting to be better known. Fantastic abstract painter. Another self-portrait. Another self-portrait. One of the one of the last I did. Um, Finn Anke is the uh, the um, uh, professor of gender studies and is the books editor for trans. Transgender Quarterly. You may want to say just a few words about your concept for the risk pictures. Um, okay. Um, so uh, this is the largest of them, but the last couple that we saw, and I don't know that there's, I don't think that there's another one here. Um, so in, uh, what year was it? Around 2016, 20, let's see, this is 2016. So yeah, then is 2015. Um, I think it was the end of 2014 that I started this. Um, I decided that I wanted to, so uh, as you may have gathered, a lot of what I do is about the power dynamic between artist and subject. And it's something that is extremely important to me, which I think has been extremely problematic through most of art history, as we know it, as far as we know it. And, you know, going back to the idea that it's hard to be looked at for some people um, and the tradition of the the obtrusive gaze, the ownership gaze, um, you know, what's uh, for... uh, um, shortened it sometimes as the male gaze, but there's, there's more complexity than that. Um, I have been looking for ways to uh, subvert the, the power dynamic um, increasingly over the years. And I decided that I wanted to really find a way to make um, uh, the power relationship between me and my subject as equal as I could make it um, without actually having them do a portrait of me. I thought about it, but that was, that really wasn't gonna do it um, because most of the people I wanted to work with were not visual artists and that wasn't really gonna, it wasn't gonna produce parody. So instead what I did was for the, up until COVID, what I was doing was Uh, a subject would commit to a certain number of sittings, at least five, and each sitting would be um, uh, three hours long, but at two hours I would leave and just leave my house entirely. And they would have permission to do anything they wanted in my home, Um, eat stuff, break stuff, steal stuff, go through my stuff, And I was never going to ask, no matter what I came home to, I was never going to ask. 
but in exchange, they had to commit to altering their own portrait while I was gone. So I was risking two things. One was, you know, everything I owned <laughs> and my privacy. Um, and the other was whether or not they would wreck the portrait at some point in the process. And that has been extremely fruitful. Mm -hmm. um, each one of the ones that says the Rick's pictures here on my website or in the book, um, they've all been worked on uh, to varying degrees by the, my collaborator. So that's why it says by Riva Lair and Finanke, by Riva Lair and Alice Shepard. Um, I won't go into what each person added. You can see it on the websites. But, um, but Finn and Alice were two of the most um, involved in the process. Right. Thank you. Uh, again, we could talk about this one for a long time. Uh. Um, so that is a painting. It's almost life size. Um, Carrie is a professor of disability studies here in Chicago. Um, she's also part of the BDSM community. And we talked a lot about the eroticizing of pain, about the role of pain in disability and the way that she had coped with it in part by eroticizing it. And so she posed for me in BDSM gear. And there's one funny story. Um, I, yeah, I think I did put it in the book. I hardly remember anymore. Uh, this was this won an award um, at a local museum, and or rather another portrait, an earlier portrait. I think the one of Alice had won an award, and the award was that I was going to get a solo show at the museum, and so. This was the piece I did, I believe, after Alice, and it took me a very long time. This was eight month painting easily. And I sent them the image and one of, um, actually, I think it's 2018, but my dates are all over the place. Um, so I sent them not just this, but Carrie and I had wanted to document the process. And so we had been writing down on these big pieces of handmade paper, our thoughts about, um, about uh, she's also a performer besides being a professor and her field is disability and performance. So we were writing all of our thoughts. We, we tend to get heavy into theory when we're together. And, uh, but also I wanted to once again, underline the fact that all my work is based on relationship and on intimacy. So when Carrie was sitting for me, we had what we called the Carrie corner, which was a little chair that had like a heating pad and pillows. And then I had a little table next to it. And I was always feeding her cookies and ginger tea, cookies and ginger tea. And so I brought that to the museum. I brought the whole Carrie corner, the cookies, the ginger tea, the whole thing. And um, it was supposed to originally be something where anybody coming into the museum could take cookies and have a cup of ginger tea. Unfortunately, sideways to what happened, the, the museum ended up with a horrible ant infestation before I got there. Mm. So that whole part had to go. But, um, but the museum uh, does a summer camp for children and they freaked out when somebody on some committee saw what I was going to show. Like, we can't have this. Children cannot see this. And I'm thinking, these kids are, I mean, the, the piece that won me the award was another, it was Alice. It was another nude. Yeah. So they knew I do a lot of nudes, right? This one, this is what won me the award. So the only difference between this and that is that Carrie's got these, these yeah. black straps on. How many third graders are going to know that this is BDSM gear? Like nobody knows what this is. You know, the, if, if your fourth grader knows that those are nipple clamps, you've got bigger problems than having them see the painting. But they banished me to a far gallery upstairs in the back of the museum. Yeah. 
uh, where nobody was going to see it. And there it languished. You know, I had people go to the museum and tell me, Reva, I thought you were going to have a show. And I'm like, it was there. The whole installation was there. Oh, and finally, we had a sound installation where there were speakers set up because Carrie and I had been taped through our whole collaboration. And a sound artist had made uh, a recording of the two of us in conversation. So when you walked in, it was supposed to be hearing the two of us talking, seeing all these documents. And then I, you know, originally sitting down and, and having cookies and tea. And, um, and yeah, they literally put it behind a curtain up in the top floor with, oh, right, I forgot. It was an advisory sign. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be 21 to go beyond the curtain. So it's the silliest thing I've ever had happen to me in a museum. Thank you for that story. I think we um, we should open it up to questions. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll put up the the just one more image, but I know we have several in the chat. And Logan, do you want to come in? We can look at this while Logan comes in. Disability activist Alice Wong. A lot of you will know Alice's work. I hope, maybe. And you wrote a, an op-ed piece for the New York Times about the, the trials and tribulations of working over Zoom, so we can yeah. refer people to that too. Right. And I think the last Zoom portrait was there. Sharona, maybe. Oh, that's it's a different kind of risk pictures. Here we go. Yeah. There's another Zoom portrait, and the previous two are um, different way of doing risk where we were doing it over the mail after uh, COVID hit. So anyway, so that's my work. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, David, for this, and Reva, for this very stimulating and amazing conversation. I feel like we really got to know your work extremely well, Reva, so it was definitely worth, worth it. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, and so I kind of wanted to start with this one, which I was also quite interested in. Um, Catherine White asks, I was also, I, I was interested to hear that you titled your book chapters after works of horror fiction. Um, has the genre of horror influenced or inspired parts of your work at all? And I definitely noticed maybe some references to slightly kind of violent or kind of gory um, kind of symbols here and there in your work. I'm not sure if that was intended or not, um, but I don't know if you ever thought about that before or what your thoughts on that are. I'm trying to think, I mean, the gorier work isn't in here. Um, well, I guess the that one self-portrait, maybe. Um, I mean, my book is about being a monster. So short answer, yes. Um, my life has been informed by monster movies and monster stories. I'm extremely interested in the field of monsterology, um, which is a field. Uh, my friend Michael Chambers has um, founded the Institute for Monster Studies at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, I'm supposed to at some point go out there and do a semester as a visiting artist. So fingers crossed on that. Um, but yes, I increasingly over the years have been writing about, thinking about, and uh, interweaving the idea of various kinds of monsters into my work and my thoughts. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so- Could we take down the image? I'd sure. really like to just oh, see yes. people. Absolutely, just, let's just have humans, right, Reva? Please. Yeah, Hi. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, here are people. <laughs> let's see if I can get to gallery view. Here we go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so another in interesting thing that came up um, was your mention about um, art history and how you kind of thought it might take away from your studio art practice. 
Um, so we have a question um, from Mary Frances Ivy. On the note of art history, I, in, a, in a different talk, she remembers your, you saying that you were grappling with art history um, as opposed to Lucian Freud's and Vincent Desiderio's, for example, version of art history, I guess, is in representing disabled and queer people who tend to be absent from art history. Would you share more about your thoughts on that? Uh, I think maybe, there are two questions in there. Um, maybe I, could you just share a little bit about, um, you know, your, the way that art history, the, your thoughts on art history, particularly from the perspective of representation of disabled and queer people? Sure. Um, I mean, Vince is, is one of my painting heroes and a, and a really sweet guy. Um, Freud, I, I have complicated feelings about and did not know him, um, probably just as well. I can't imagine us talking to each other. Uh, if you look at the history of portraiture, and I mean portraiture, not figuration, disabled people are largely absent because the history of portraiture is the history of power. And they are by and large commissions by um, wealthy people for the uh, furthering and maintenance of power. So for instance, some portraits are uh, of young women, for instance, or in some cases, young men, but mainly young women were sent to, so this was a wealthy family commissioning a portrait of a daughter or a sister or somebody um, because they wanted to marry her off to a, a, a powerful family. So their version of OK Cupid was to have Holbein or somebody do her portrait and then send it off to the, the duchy of wherever so that you know, the family at the other end saw that she looked healthy and she looked whatever and, you know, pretty young woman. And, and, um, and so that would help further the marriage. Um, and now we just think, oh, lovely portrait of a young woman, but we're not seeing the, the instrumentalism um, behind the image. But if your daughter or sister was disabled in some identifiable way, you either had the option of hiding that in the portrait, so we'll never know if, if she was or not, for the most part, or the disabled kid just certainly wouldn't be um, offered, you know? I mean, who wants to start a fight with a wealthy family? So um, some of the only portraits of disabled people that we do have tend to be, ironically, of uh, royals very powerful royals where they couldn't avoid doing a portrait of the king. So like, I was it Charles the second, no, Charles the, one of the Charleses, the last of the Charleses um, was the family had, had interbred so badly that he had multiple um, genetic impairments and his portraits try to make him look a little bit more uh, functional than he was, but when you read the accounts, you realize that this guy was extremely impaired. So, you know, those tend to be um, often the only actual portraits that we get, by which I mean, by a portrait, what I mean is a painting of someone that is about their value, their, their specific identity, um, the importance of them having a specific identity and some narrative aspect of who they were in society. That is different from a figure painting. So figure paintings tend to be narrative, tutelary, and often posed by um, uh, um, lower class people who acted as models. And so you get a lot of disabled people there, mm. but mainly in um, uh, religious painting where um, you have, you know, lepers and, and the blind and 
people with skin afflictions and missing limbs and all these things, and they're there to be healed by Jesus or the saint or some, you know, mm-hmm. something like that. And so usually you'll see that the disabled person is partly shrouded or partly hidden, somewhat occluded in the image, and uh, the saint or Jesus is um, extremely foreground. And so, uh, and then later you start getting genre painting where there'll be paintings of um, uh, people in society, you know, the blind beggar again, or the, the little match girl, or the, you know, this is, this is what our society is made of. But those are not portraits for the most part. Again, those are figure paintings, figure drawings, et, you know, etchings that are about um, uh, either a religious thing or um, a commentary on society, but those are not in, those are not really to be understood as individuals. They're a type. Each one is a type. Right. And um, hearing you speak about it too, it made me realize not only is the type, but it's also the idea is that they're only represented as kind of this, um, this kind of moment just before they're kind of healed or put into perfection, right? So the yeah, yeah. The, the, the difference is going to be eradicated at some right. point, right? We know, like we, we can infer that from the imagery as well. And so that takes me into another question that we've got, um, which you've uh, talked about quite a bit too, is the relationship between the medical perfection professions and then social ideal deals for bodies and this kind of visual representation, um, especially this obsession with what can medicine do to change the body or, or per- re-put the body back into this per- perfect, per- perfect body. Um, do you see your artistic practice um, as something that is critical um, to, it's criticizing that kind of dynamic um, in, in medicine? Um, If so, how do you believe your work resists or subverts that? Uh, That's a really big question. (laughs) Um, God. Uh, um, I'm not against addressing suffering. When disability pride was in its earlier stages, it was extremely suspicious of medicine to the point it really at times became anti-interventionist. I was never like that. Partly I come from a medical family and I teach in medical humanities and and I I find medicine actually quite beautiful. Um, But as I write in the book, when you really look at quite a number of surgeries that purport to be about the cessation of suffering and you really push them to the wall, and I don't mean the obvious ones like um, plastic surgery of certain kinds. um, So many of them do come down to a push for normalization. And um, you know, alteration, alterations of certain limb conditions uh, can be touted as adding function, um, but often it's about uh, giving the person the appearance of a more normal limb, whether or not it, it works better. Um, I know it's not all, not the intent, but people, conflate the normalization of the body with the healing of the body because medicine has taught us this um, forever, that those two things are, are not separate. And so my critique is that we examine this more closely. I mean, it's very, very, very complex because for instance, as I touched on, on, plastic surgery, if you are in a society in which looking a certain way um, makes your life a misery, 
And I mean, I'm writing a book right now. I'm writing my first fiction. And my character has an undefined facial deformity. Fa facial, and I don't like that word. Uh, facial variance. Yeah. I never Different say what it, what it is. I never say what it is. Right. But it gets her stared at and it gets her uh, challenged. But I want the viewer or the reader, so used to viewer, the reader to ask themselves, at least subconsciously, what would make them very, very uncomfortable. And for complicated reasons, she isn't, hasn't gotten it corrected, but her life is made difficult by having this thing. And so even if, and, and in the book, she's, her face functions. It's not that she's lost a, an important function. It's a, it's a social disability that she's carrying. And so, um, you know, if someone has, because of an accident, has a large scar or a burn, or a, even my little brother is born with a strawberry mark, or, you know, these different things, that he got teased really badly. I, I saw that. There was nothing wrong with his face at all. He just had this thing called a strawberry mark. What is the line of suffering? You know, what is the time lag between convincing society not to treat people like that, that there's no reason to treat people like that, and succumbing to the pain of being in a society that treats people like that? So I don't have one critique. I, I just insist that these things be examined. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right, well, I think, I mean, we have maybe one last question, but you kind of already started talking about it. Um, which is, what are your current projects? Evidently, you're working on a fiction. Do you have any new series, art series uh, coming up that we should look out for or anything in that realm to, that we should be watching for? I'm working on a very large portrait of Rosemary Garland Thompson, the bioethicist. And that's going to take me at least another eight months. Mm. Big, big ass painting. So trying to, yeah, just trying, trying to write and paint at the same time uh, is, uh, is hard. And you're teaching also, right? For the moment, I'm considering not doing that anymore. So I'm 63, been doing it a very long time. Well, there might be other things I would like to do at this point without worrying about canceling and rescheduling classes every five seconds. Right, right. So, well, we know from, from what you've shared with us this evening that you must be a, a wonderful teacher as well as a, as a writer and an artist. It, it's been wonderful to spend this time with you, Reva. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, we, again, I recommend your book to everyone who, who hasn't had the pleasure of reading it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's um, I, I mean, it's it's both heartbreaking and hilarious um, by turns, and and so honest and revealing, and and um, so uh, really, I'm just so um, want to congratulate you again on that accomplishment and everything else you shared with us, um, and um, we uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you and following your work going forward. And um, I'll invite everyone uh, to come back uh, next semester. We have three more lectures in the Intersections of Identity series coming up. But for, for now, thank you again, Reva Lair, and, and I wish everyone a good evening. Stay safe, everybody, okay? Till then, good night.